Finding great treasure and magic items is one of the most fun and rewarding parts of Dungeons & Dragons, but it can be hard to balance all those magic items with your attunement slots and the player character's power level. Not every treasure hoard the player characters find can have world-shattering magic items of incredible power. And well, it's a lot of fun as well to explore some of the more creative magic items or even quirky and somewhat useless magic items to award the player characters as a fun alternative to a powerful reward. Finding magic items in the mid-range, useful magic items that the player characters can equip and use and just have a few extra perks for their player characters is actually really satisfying. So we've taken an in-depth look to see some useful magic items that you can award to your player characters that won't require attunement. My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we discuss everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for dungeon masters and guides for players. We upload new videos every Thursday, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. So in looking at 10 different magic items from the pages of the Dungeon Master's Guide that a Dungeon Master can confidently give out to player characters of almost any level of play, whether low level characters or high level player characters, although there's a few on this list that you might wanna to keep to the higher levels, you can give these magic items out to your players as a simple reward for a job well done, a simple quest, or something pried off the corpse of an enemy. We're listing these magic items in alphabetical order, and none of these items require attunement. These are items that can be equipped and give a tangible boost to the party members that can be used in combat or exploration. It is worth noting that if you're looking for something a little bit quirkier or interesting that the players can use in a problem solving context, check out our video on creative magic items right up over here. There's a lot to look at today, so let's get rolling. Let's kick things off with the elephant in the room and that's looking at plus one, plus two, and plus three weapons, armor, and shields. We've grouped these all together because they're all quite generic and they all have quite similar properties. If you played a little bit of Dungeons and Dragons, you're probably familiar with the idea of a plus one weapon or plus one armor. Simply put, plus one weapons or plus two weapons or plus three weapons gives the stated bonus to attack and damage rolls made using that weapon. And plus one armor or plus one shields has that increase to the armor class above an item of its regular type commensurately with the bonus of the weapon or armor. We've included these in the list because they don't require attunement and a lot of people forget that. Now Monty and I do find that these items are a little more boring than some of the other options. They give a very static boost, but a player character often does enjoy getting those boosts and seeing those numbers go up on their character sheet. As boring as these items are, there are ways to do better than that. There's a fantastic table in the Dungeon Master's Guide that you can roll on to give you ideas for the origin of the item and a minor property. You can add this to the item without requiring additional attunement and still use it as is. Keep in mind that plus one, two, or three armor and shields can actually have a pretty big impact on the game because of the way bounded accuracy works in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, this means that even a small boost to a player character's attack rolls or armor class and even their damage rolls can have a pretty big impact in battle. A player character equipped with a plus three weapon wearing plus three armor is actually really strong. And these items alone don't require attunement, which means that they can be combined with the much more powerful wondrous items which do require attunement. So because these items can layer on top of other attunement based items, you can get some very unforeseen results, such as a player character wearing plus three full plate, carrying a plus three shield, and wearing a ring of protection and a cloak of protection, and having an AC in the high 20s. What about giving a plus three weapon to a character who's wearing a belt of giant strength? This can make them pretty deadly in combat. So for you DMs out there who are awarding magic items, just keep in mind that if you're gonna give out a plus one or especially a plus two or plus three option, keep in mind the other magic items that are floating around within the party because you want to avoid a character being able to combine legendary magic items with items in this way that can cause a really big imbalance in the power level. Can feel really awesome to have an armor class of 28 and be striking with a plus 20 attack bonus and dealing tons of damage on every single hit, 
But this is one of those little insidious ways that awarding too much treasure to your player characters and letting them stack non-attunement with attunement items together can end up with a little bit of an unexpected juggernaut in your party. Measure this out because if you do give out a bunch of plus three weapons and plus three armor to your entire party, you might actually find that you have to kick up the challenge rating of the monsters to compensate for the, all the extra treasure that you gave out. Next up, we have a great suit of armor for those who are afraid to get crit a lot, and that's adamantium armor. Adamantium armor is an uncommon magic item that doesn't require attunement. It can take the form of any medium or heavy armor that isn't hide. And while you wear a suit of adamantium armor, any critical hit made against you becomes a normal hit instead. This is such a simple rule to apply to a set of armor, but the amount of times it's come up in our games, <laughs> yeah. and Monty has been disappointed as he picks up his handful of dice just to be reminded it's not a crit. And those are always the great moments as a player yeah, to yeah. remind your DM, sorry, your crit against me doesn't hit. Yeah, it's one of those kind of backfire magic items as far as the DM is concerned because the players love it. Every time it comes up, that's like, I got a critical hit against you. And the fighter says, no, you didn't. So it kind of worked against myself. I was disappointed routinely, but it was worth it for the enjoyment it gave the players. I do think that at the end of the day, that is the key element is I've played several different player characters and anytime that there's an option to negate a critical hit that the DM lands on you, Nothing makes you as a player feel more powerful to be able yeah. to shove it back in the DM's face <laughs> and just say, you don't get to crit me. This isn't something that's going to break the game or cause the power level to go too high because crits don't happen that often, but it still feels really powerful to be able to ignore them. And when crits do happen to the player characters, it's often really bad. Because player characters don't think about what happens when they get crit. They're always like, I hope I saw a critical hit myself. But you never think about what's going to happen to your hit points after you take that critical hit. So it really gives you that assurance. And as well, it's interesting too, because if you're paralyzed and normally a circumstance where automatic critical hits would be scored against you because you're unconscious or paralyzed, the armor will protect you in those circumstances too. That is some magical armor. The next item on the list are the Boots of Elven Kind, which are perfect for you stealthy rogues or other sneaky individuals out there. When you wear these boots, your footsteps do not make a sound, which gives you advantage on stealth checks made to move silently. This is a fantastic little perk for any monk, rogue, ranger, or other self-based character. They're going to love this magic item. It's going to come up all the time in play. Yes, when combined with a rogue with expertise in stealth, it might mean that that character is the sneak master rivaling solid snake, but they'll have a lot of fun with it regardless. And that's really the point of a magic item like this is you're not going to give this magic item to a character who isn't stealthy, although maybe you will. Maybe there's uses for the big The fighter. rogue's always going to grab it. There, it's, yeah, it's true. The rogue is always going to take these. I'm thinking of myself here. If I was the rogue, I would take those and say, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm using these. But advantage on a plus 10 stealth check is going to be great. But the whole point of playing a rogue is that you want to be stealthy. So really, you're just doubling down on that option for that player character. For those of you that are quite fashion conscious, you might also want to pick up a Cloak of Elven Kind, which grants you the similar ability to get advantage when you are hiding, not moving silently. However, the Cloak of Elven Kind does actually require attunement. Although completing the set is a great feeling and really makes you feel like the true master of stealth. We've grouped the next two magic items together, and these are definitely two that I would keep to a higher level party. They are the Broom of Flying, an uncommon magic item, and the Carpet of Flying, a very rare magic item. Both of these magic items do exactly what they say on the tin. You can ride them as objects, either taking after your favorite witch or wizard from the Harry Potter universe, or soaring through the clouds on a magic carpet ride like Aladdin. Be careful because the amount of weight these items can carry is limited. Although with the broom of flying being able to carry 500 pounds and the carpet of flying being able to carry anywhere from 200 to 800 pounds, depending on its size, there are actually a lot of creative ways that players can use this. 
I've had players use their broom or carpet of flying to carry objects long distances that would be too heavy to otherwise carry back and forth, or to move treasure out of a cavern, or to carry multiple player characters to a certain destination that would be otherwise impossible to get to. Regardless of what level your players are, gaining the ability to fly is game changing. And an object like the broom of flying or the carpet of flying gives flight to your entire party on demand. Because these items don't require attunement like the boots of flying and the wings of flying, it means that the party members can easily pass these items amongst themselves, allowing themselves to ferry them across gaps or fly up on top of castle ramparts or travel together in groups over long distances. This really opens up a lot of creative play for the players, but also means that if you put these in the hands of your player characters, you're gonna to have to reconsider the types of environments and obstacles that you're challenging your player characters with. If your party has the ability to fly, castle walls are a different kind of challenge than a party that isn't able to fly. If your party is able to fly, crossing a long and dangerous river or a deep, gorge is not the same kind of problem that it is for a party that cannot fly. So while these items are really rewarding and highly sought after by the player characters, it is worth considering the impact that this will have on your adventure design and encounter building. One thing that I want to point out when we talk about the differences between these objects that don't require attunement versus something like the boots of flying that do require attunement is that these items need to be ridden by the player characters, which also means there's a chance that they could be knocked off of their broom or carpet. Unlike the boots, which are strapped to your feet, it basically means that there's not many conditions in which you wouldn't be flying or you would be knocked right out of your boots. But on a carpet, if you're hit hard enough, you might be asking for certain saving throws to stop those party members from falling off of their carpet or broom. On the flip side of this, a character that's wearing the boots of flying or the wings of flying that is stunned or incapacitated is simply going to drop like a rock. On, but a character that is on a carpet of flying and is then stunned or incapacitated, depending on the carpet of flying, maybe the carpet is still able to stay in the air even though the character riding it is stunned. I do think that the broom of flying and the carpet of flying in keeping after Disney movies are often great great magic items to imbue with intelligence and personalities as well, and maybe give them a little bit of extra flexibility and fun to make them really memorable items in the party too. Next up, we come to one of our favorite items that I've seen in almost every campaign that I've played, and that is the Cape of the Mountebank. This cape is a rare magic item that allows the wearer to cast Dimension Door on themselves once per day. Like the Dimension Door spell, they can bring along one friend with them, and I like to imagine the two characters stepping inside the cloak and disappearing in a puff of smoke like a classic stage magician, and then appearing in an equal puff of smoke somewhere else as well. This item to me is almost more fun than the ability to teleport that you get from being able to cast spells. The reason for that is the creativity that comes into play with only having one use per day. This small limitation gives the player characters that option to teleport two of them to or from somewhere. But how they're going to get around all the other obstacles, that's up to them. It's a great little option to have in their back pocket, but when and where it comes into play is always exciting to watch. The range of the teleportation on Dimension Door is a pretty short range, only a couple hundred feet. But the player characters don't require line of sight to their destination, so they can specify approximately where they want to land. They can say whether they want to teleport 300 feet straight up, 300 feet straight forward, right across the bridge, or otherwise. This does require a little bit of planning and foresight on the player's part, lest they end up somewhere that doesn't quite support them and end up falling or somewhere trapped. But it is a lot of creativity, and especially the fact that the Cape of the Mountain Bank can be used by any character without attunement means that characters like the Rogue or the Fighter, characters that would never normally have teleportation in their suite of abilities, unless they're an Eldritch Knight or Arcane Trickster, now gain this flexibility and this kind of ace in the hole to help them escape a tricky situation. Dimension Door is one of the coolest spells in the entire game, and I absolutely love it. But being able to put it on a stylish cape and wear it on my back, that's even cooler. The next item on our list is Elven Chain. 
This finely wrought chain shirt carries with it an extra plus one bonus to armor class on top of the base bonus. And its key perk is that it can be worn by any character, even if they lack proficiency in that armor. Meaning that you wizards, sorcerers, lightly armored warlocks, and other unarmored characters can slip on a suit of elven chain and find yourself protected from the blows of your enemies. Since it doesn't require attunement and can be worn by people who don't otherwise have those proficiencies, having played many spellcasters in my day, I always shudder when I look down at my AC of 12 or 13 and decide what spells I need to blow to keep that up. Yeah. But being able to take an elven chain shirt and really give you that little bit of extra oomph to your AC can be really, really helpful and really make you feel less like the squishy glass cannon. It's not uncommon for many spellcasting characters to have a bonus to their dexterity score of plus two or plus three with a dexterity of 14 to 16. But I find most of my spellcasters rarely have a dexterity higher than that. So most spellcasters can readily fill out a chain shirt with elven chain and end up with an armor class of 16. This is a really respectable armor class. And even for some characters like clerics, uh, particularly clerics of the domains that don't get the heavy armor proficiency, wearing a suit of el elven chain and slapping on a shield gives you a really sturdy AC of 18, which is perfect for spellcaster types that aren't gonna be on the front lines of battle, but still wanna protect themselves against the threats that can sneak past the fighters and paladins and barbarians and start stabbing you in the kidneys. Now that you're a spellcaster with elven chain, you don't have to blow those spell slots on casting shield or mage armor every day and in every combat. You can reliably use those spell slots for other more important spells because you know that you have the AC to back you up. Many spellcasters will seek out things like rings of protection or bracers of defense to boost up their armor class, but all of these items require attunement. Elven Chain, if you can get your hands on it, is probably one of your best options, and you could still combine it with the Rings and Cloaks of Protection, just not the Bracers of Defense. Handles over to the Monk. Monty and I are notorious for recommending and playing variant humans in so much of our D&D campaigns. There's one downside to humans, though, and that brings us to our next magic item, the Goggles of Night, which allow a creature that doesn't have dark vision to now have it. You gain dark vision of 60 feet while you wear the goggles of night and get to make that stylish fashion choice of wearing some awesome steampunky goggles with your character. So many of my characters have sought out the goggles of night that when I'm picking a miniature for my character, I usually just look for one with goggles. I mean, you know me, I'm a huge fan of uh, characters with goggles, but it is so important as the only human in a party of otherwise dark vision players that you find the goggles of night and as a matter of fact i also see this magic item as a little bit of a ticket for the dm who's trying to deal with you know, the player characters going into dark scary caves and they realize that nobody cares because they all have dark vision except the one player who's now always struggling and this is kind of that little way of the dm saying you know what we just don't need to worry about this anymore have some goggles of night now you all can see we're over it let's move on so you're saying that i should award your character in our campaign goggles of night as soon as possible absolutely Absolutely. <laughs> it's already come up that I can't see in the yeah. woods at night. So. You're, you're, you were the one that decided to play the human rogue. <laughs> uh, never again. Never will I play a human. Need that dark vision. No, you'll probably play a few more Barian humans I before know. we're done. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. The next magic item on our list is a rare, wondrous item that part of me is kind of surprised doesn't require attunement, and that is the periapt of proof against poison. While you wear this silver chain, you are immune to the poison condition and have immunity to poison damage. Damage resistance, let alone damage immunity, is something that you can usually only get from attuning to a magic item or casting a spell. And the fact that this magic item gives you immunity to the poison condition and poison damage is absolutely stunning, considering that after fire damage, poison damage is so common in the monster manual. There are tons of creatures across all creature types, from fiends, undead, monstrosities, humanoids, dark elves, there's poison everywhere in the monster manual from all the snakes, spiders, and everything that just wants to stab you and bite you. And this magic item is just a big no to all that stuff. 
Not only that, but when I think of dangerous dungeons, a lot of traps involve poison as well. There's poison gases, poisoned spikes, poisoned everything. You're, you're walking into poison rooms all the time. The amount of times that you're gonna get hit with poison really makes this a standout option, and it's surprising that it doesn't require attunement. The way that I'm imagining this item is that it would be for a late game item after the party has dealt with a slew of poison-inducing foes. Once they've gone to the Temple of Poison, or whatever this place is, and they've found the item that allows them to then move forward mm -hmm. into the campaign without having to worry about all the poison damage they were taking yeah. before. That's really how I could see this coming into play, but dropping it to an early party and then trying to throw poison damage at them and remembering, oh no, this one guy doesn't take any of that damage ever, that can be a little intense. Yeah, just imagining a character with a periaptive proof against poison and adamantium armor, they're kind of set. The next item we're looking at is a shield emblazoned with the symbol of an eye, and that is the Sentinel Shield, which grants its bearer advantage on initiative rolls and perception checks. So the two rolls that are so critically important in the game, this one magic item without attunement gives you advantage on both of them. What I love about this magic item, though, is that most of the time, most of the time, the character who is going to be picking up a shield could be a strength-based character, which gives them low dexterity. This is true. And that means that they are probably the one who's going last most of the time. I'm thinking of our case where we had a heavily armored fighter who grabbed the shield. It actually kind of evened out their initiative roles so that they were more likely to go around the mid-range mm -hmm. of the combat. Not only that, but they also had some of the lowest perception in the party. So this is a nice way to give that player who's struggling to keep up with initiative rolls that extra little edge in combat. I completely agree. This is a great magic item for a tanky fighter, paladin, cleric, even a druid or barbarian that is more defensive in nature is going to love this magic item because that is often the really tough thing about playing the tanky defensive character is that you want to be up in the front lines of battle but then what happens is you roll low on your initiative and the rogue and the ranger and the wizard all go before you and then the monsters go and attack all your allies while you're still stuck foot slogging back up 30 feet to get to the front lines to actually be the tank. I really like the image of a dexterity based paladin or fighter wearing light armor, using a shield and wielding a rapier and still being that kind of defensive duelist type character. And then if they have the sentinel shield and maybe the alert feet, so they're gonna be really quick on the draw. And that's a really nimble, finesse feeling character that's very different from playing say a rogue or a ranger. I can't even imagine a dex based character with a sentinel shield and the alert feet. How high can their initiative a get? Plus 10 bonus if they max out their dexterity that they then have advantage on. To close off this list of magic items, we're going to talk about a little magic wand that can go very far in your campaigns, and that's the Wand of Magic Missiles. The Wand of Magic Missiles is an uncommon magic item that does not require attunement. It has seven charges, and you can expend one of those charges to cast the Magic Missile spell, firing three missiles. You can expend more charges from the from the wand at the time of casting to f cause an additional missile to fire, getting one extra missile for each charge you expend. The Wand of Magic Missiles is a great addition to any spellcaster's arsenal, giving them a quick and easy option for delivering some ready damage to their enemies. However, it doesn't require that it be used by a spellcaster. Thanks to it not requiring attunement, it can be picked up by any member of the party as a quick access to some force damage. And it's a pretty good chunk of force damage as well. If you completely blow out all the charges from the wand, you're going to be f firing out nine magic missiles. Sending those up against a single target can actually deal almost 30 points of force damage, which is a pretty impressive hit on its own, especially for one that strikes completely unerringly. It's almost like having a little bit of a rocket or a dart that just goes out 
and can hit an enemy for a good 30 points of damage. A lot of people out there don't like the D4 damage of Magic Missile, even though it hits automatically. But putting it into a wand and handing it to a player means that they have a reliable source of damage whenever they need it. Yeah, it's also great for those low-level spellcasters who want something to do instead of casting cantrips over and over again once they've run out of spell slots. I really love the Wand of Magic Missile as just a simple and effective magic item to give to spellcasters, and one that can kind of be a iconic item for them to use throughout their character's entire career. So this has been a look at 10 useful magic items that don't require attunement in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you have any useful magic items that you love, tell us about them in the comments below. If you're enjoying our show, please consider supporting our work on Patreon. You can find out how by following the links in the description below. Don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've taken an in-depth look at many other types of magic items in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.